At last count, women hold fewer than 10% of the highest paying jobs in Canada. And only 3.5% of companies listed on the country's biggest stock exchange have a female CEO. The obvious question is, why? Why do women remain so badly represented at the top of corporate Canada? And more to the point, what can we do about it? You'll find the answers right here, thanks to years of independent research and personal insights from 50 female executives from across Canada, including some of the highest profile leaders in the country. Together, we expose the hidden rules that are holding women back in business. And we provide a revolutionary plan of action for women looking to get ahead and for organizations looking to make gender equity a reality. Who are thrilled to confirm that early reviews have been extremely positive. In the kind words of RBC board chair Katie Taylor, the invisible rules is a must read for any aspiring leader. It confirms that gender equity has become a fundamental and differentiating business strategy in today's complex environment and goes on to provide a compelling framework for eliminating the barriers that continue to impede the progress of women to the C-suite. It's a framework we'd love to share with you on your personal path to leadership and the pursuit of gender equity. Welcome to today's session, The Invisible Rules, a fast track to gender equity. We're thrilled that you could join us. My name is Paul Harrietha, and on behalf of my co-author, Holly Kutzel-Famel, and our wonderful panelists, Sharon Ludlow, Don Jai, and Mary Culver, I'd like to welcome you to today's webcast. We'd also like to thank Green Shield Canada for their generous support of today's event and congratulate them for their public commitment to equity and inclusion. They're a wonderful company and a valued partner. Our intent over the next hour is to shed some essential light on gender equity in the workplace, or more to the point, gender inequity. Why does it exist and how can it be addressed quickly and easily? Holly and I will take a few minutes to summarize our research and share a couple of readings from the book. We'll then turn things over to our panelists to share their personal insights as successful leaders. Now, given the format and audience size, we can't interact with you as much as we'd like to, but we do invite you to share our observations using the chat function and to submit your questions using the Q&A function. You'll find both at the bottom of your screen and we'll do our best to address those questions later in the session. So with that, Let's begin. Given that this is a book launch of sorts, I'd like to start with a short reading from the opening pages of The Invisible Rules. I think it'll help to set the stage. Like it or not, there are two sets of rules that govern employment practices in corporate Canada. One set for men and one set for women. One set that continues to preserve a long-standing male power structure by assuming or assuring that a disproportionate number of men achieve senior leadership status and the big paychecks that go with those positions. And a second set of powerful, deeply rooted and largely imperceptible rules that make the pursuit of senior leadership far more demanding and uncertain for aspiring women. Men get to be men in a form of corporate Darwinism women must adapt or die from a career perspective. While we might not be aware of these invisible rules, their devastating impact remains pretty obvious. We see highly qualified and ambitious women enter the workforce all charged up and ready to change the world, only to be disappointed as they watch male colleagues pass them on the climb up the corporate ladder. And we see these frustrated women abandon traditional workplace pipelines in droves to start small businesses join early stage companies, lead not for profits or leave the workforce altogether. Little wonder, wonder that women hold only about 10% of the highest paying jobs at Canada's largest publicly created companies. Despite the honorable efforts of strong advocates, allies and supporting organizations, 
the pursuit of gender equity in Canada has moved at a glacial pace. Sure, we've seen lots of positive change over the past 50 years, but we still have a very long way to go. By any reasonable measure, women remain dramatically underrepresented at senior leadership levels in Canada. This inequity is tough on women. And as Canadian business icon Vernette Verschuren confirms, this lack of equity impedes corporate Canada's ability to compete head to head with progressive economies worldwide. As she says, gender equity is a fundamental business issue. We need to understand that diversity of thought is no longer a luxury for organizations who want to compete internationally or globally. To ensure success, organizations must adjust to the needs and perspectives of the women and other diverse candidates who will ultimately drive their success. It's hard to lead the way when you systematically marginalize 50% of your best talent. And we hope to change that. This book exposes the invisible rules and makes it easier for women to get ahead. More to the point, it will help senior leaders and senior male leaders in particular better understand the negative impact that their attitudes and actions continue to have on so many talented and ambitious women. Unintentional perhaps, but undeniable and increasingly indefensible. With that, we'll begin. As we all know, there's nothing particularly new about gender equity. As we just mentioned, women have been fighting for equal opportunities and representation for 50 years or more. And despite these fierce efforts and a growing awareness of social justice issues, the pace of change has been painfully slow. Recent data confirmed that less than 5% of Canada's leading publicly traded companies have a female CEO. 40% report that they have zero female representation on their boards. And as we discussed, women hold only 10%, give or take, of the highest paying jobs in Canada. That's hardly equitable any way you look at it. Which raises two pretty fundamental questions. One, why do women remain so badly underrepresented at the top of corporate Canada? And two, how can we fix the situation? Now, to find the answers, Holly and I went straight to the source. We interviewed 50 female executives from across the country, including 13 who I self-identified as intersectional candidates. And based directly on the rich and highly consistent feedback we received during these interviews, Holly and I were able to, one, confirm that women do face a number of gender-specific biases and barriers, that is, invisible rules, that simply make it harder for them to achieve senior, senior leadership status. Two, we were able to identify four key strategies that aspiring female leaders can use to successfully navigate those barriers and climb the corporate ladder more easily and rapidly. And three, we collected a number of essential strategies that organizations can use to achieve gender equity sooner rather than later and with limited levels of disruption. And Holly will expand on all of these key findings in just a minute. Before I think, hand things over to her, however, I want to acknowledge that this is a passion project for me. The book was motivated by the frustrating and very real life experiences that my wife, Mary Cover, and so many of her female colleagues faced as an aspiring leader. Now, I'm pleased to confirm that Mary ultimately made it to the top of the house, but it certainly took her longer than it should have, and no doubt would have, had she been a man. I also want to acknowledge that the research opened my eyes as a man and prompted me to confront some of the unconscious biases and resulting behaviors that I had as a former CEO and board chair. What I learned through the process is that there is no overriding conspiracy to maintain the patri patriarchy. Most senior males simply remain oblivious to the invisible rules that continue to hold women back. They're largely unaware of their personal gender-based biases the overwhelming tendency for like to hire like, and the considerable disadvantage that this lack of awareness creates for aspiring female leaders. In the words of Ruth Brothers, one of our leaders, when it comes to gender equity, women need coaching, men need education, which is where this book comes in. This is our collective opportunity to spread the word, help build essential awareness, equip aspiring female leaders to ascend the corporate staircase, 
and ultimately inspire leaders and male leaders in particular to make gender equity a business priority and for all the right reasons. That's our mission. And on that optimistic note, I'd like to hand things over to Holly. Thank you so much, Paul, for your introduction. And a special thanks to Sharon, Don, and Mary. I'd also like to thank everyone else for joining us today. We're so honored that you took your time to be here with us today. We are so appreciative of the 50 remarkable leaders, including Sharon and Don and Mary, who have helped make the invisible rules a reality. And for also inspiring the next generation of incredible female leaders. I'd like to start by sharing a reading from the invisible rules. A true story. It was just another day at a leading Canadian organization. The company's senior executive team had gathered for a standard monthly planning session to discuss, among other things, succession plans and staff allocations. The intent was to ensure that A, the individual leaders had sufficient resources, including staff, to deliver their business commitments for the remainder of the year, and B, high potential staff members were receiving appropriate developmental opportunities. Now, midway through the meeting, a newly appointed female member of the senior exec team stated bluntly and emphatically that she did not want a certain high potential female assigned to her team because despite her ex excellent credentials and a proven work ethic, she was likely to get pregnant again in the next year or two. Now the executive, herself the mother of young children, quickly rationalized her position by stating that the disruption caused by a maternity leave could impact client relationships and it would require more time and energy on her part to integrate replacement staff. Bottom line, a potential mat leave was largely inconvenient. Well, you could have heard a pin drop. The uncomfortable silence that followed was finally interrupted by one of the male executives who stated quietly, but matter of factly, that discriminating against a female employee or any employee for that matter, because of parental choices and obligations was totally unacceptable. He also noted that the sentiment was particularly disturbing coming from a female executive who herself had taken two separate year long maternity leaves while successfully pursuing her senior executive position at the company. What's so compelling to me about this story is like so many of the stories in the book, how relatable it is to so many people and quite honestly to me. A number of people have asked, why this particular project? What fueled your passion to co-author a book on gender equity? And I suppose some of my motivation came from my experience as an HR profession, professional, but it also came from personal experiences. Early in my career, as an aspiring young leader, one of my managers, who also happened to be a female ma uh, manager and a hiring manager, asked me why I had applied for a promotion in her unit when I had a little one at home. Now, I don't think you'll be surprised to know that they, they did go with the other shortlisted candidate who happened to be male. And I don't suppose that despite the fact that he also had small children at home, he had been asked that very same question. Of course, that's only one of the many biases that so many women face during their leadership journey. Throughout my career, I've observed inequities, as Paul said, many of which are unintentional, but nonetheless, these inequities stifle the careers of incredibly talented women who face the invisible rules. Working with Paul, we found an opportunity to share their voices and make a difference in this space. We would like to share some of the highlights of the important concepts we explore in the Invisible Rules, including the four common biases that women face, the CAPS model, which provides a framework 
to explain the key strategies or factors that our 50 leaders attributed to their success and a very high level overview of the solutions organizations must consider in order to address gender inequity in the workplace. Now, our leaders identified four consistent factors that made it harder for them to compete directly with men for senior leadership positions. These four big biases include, one, a general need to outperform men on a sustained basis, often referred to as the prove it again bias. Two, the need to choose between likability and leadership, the tightrope. Three, the demands women face with respect to motherhood and other domestic responsibilities, the maternal wall. And finally, a subtle tendency for some women to judge one another in the workplace, which creates a, a tug of war. Now, our leaders shared with us how they were able to navigate the invisible rules and those big biases during their climb up the corporate ladder. They attribute their success to credentials, adaptability, profile, and support. What we now affect affectionately refer to as the CAPS leadership model. First of all, strong credentials give women credibility and a voice at the table. Credentials are a ticket to the dance. Adaptability provides women with the ability to balance stereotypically assertive behavior, think male, with communal behaviors, think female. Now, as our leaders told us, adaptability is not always easy, but it's absolutely critical. Our leaders also spoke of the need to cultivate a strong profile or personal brand. And finally, they shared that their success would not have been possible without considerable levels of support coming from their partners and families, outsourced support like cleaning services and supportive workplaces. Of course, they talked about the importance of sponsorship. Individuals in their worlds that were willing to showcase their considerable talent and ability. Now, we'd also like to share some initial thoughts on levy leveling the playing field and the recommendations that our leaders provided us. Now, there's a wide range of insights, including, and perhaps most importantly, gaining genuine leadership commitment from those at the top of the organization. Also, building a real awareness of issues that our leaders, our aspiring female, female leaders are facing. Changing the talent management practices to ensure that our talent management practices are genuinely inclusive. And of course, we have to have a look at compensation, the pay gap that continues to perpetuate inequities. And finally, organizations need to rethink their workplace practices to provide genuine flexible, flexible workplaces. Where we're looking at outcomes and we're measuring outcomes and not the time of day you log in and log out. Now, surely the pandemic has demonstrated that workplace flexibility is achievable and it's long overdue. Now, I'm going to leave the discussion of quotas for another day and another time. However, Paul and I both agree, it's definitely worth the conversation. Now, I'd like to leave you with this thought and I would like to emphasize something that Paul has already mentioned. As you know, Gender equity ha has been proven to be no easy task, but it shouldn't be seen as a women's issue because it is a business issue and it needs to be addressed as such. Gender equity is not something that women can fix all on their own. If they could have, it would have been solved a long, long time ago. It's time for men and women to make gender equity a business priority. Good intentions aside, nothing gets done when only half the population wants it to get done. Now, thank you so much for allowing me to share. And right now, I'd like to turn it over to Paul, who will introduce our panelists today. Thank you, Holly. It's been a true pleasure sharing the journey with you. 
At this point, I'm thrilled to hand things over to our remarkable pan panelist, Sharon Ludlow, former CEO of two major insurance organizations in Canada and a sitting member of the Green Shield Board. Don Jai, CEO of the UBC Investment Management Trust and Mary Cover, Managing Director of Pension Strategy at the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan. Now, as we were preparing for the session, it struck Holly and me that these three leaders could form a pretty awesome consulting firm. We've got a chartered accountant, a chartered financial analyst, and a fellow, hard to ignore the sex as qualifier, of the Canadian Institute of Actuaries. All three have built amazing careers in traditionally male-dominated professions and serve as living, breathing testaments to the importance of credentials, that first platform on the CAPS leadership framework. Welcome, ladies, and on to the questions. Sharon, let's begin with you. Why, in very general terms, do you think women remain so badly underrepresented at senior levels in corporate Canada? It's a, it's a great question to start with, Paul, um, but I tell you, we could spend the entire afternoon on that alone. So I will offer summary comments only. Um, it really is the million dollar question. Holly has just done a fantastic job of outlining the real business rationale uh, for having gender equity and in fact, diversity of all dimensions. Uh, and so the fact that we don't have gender equity or diversity, generally speaking across corporate Canada, academia or the government um, is still quite shocking. But if we had, you know, if it was the million dollar question and if we could answer it with one simple word or one simple response, you know, we would have taken that prize money and gone home a long time ago. What we found and what you both found as authors is that there are many, many reasons and some of which are very unique to each individual and her circumstances. Some of the issues that Holly already outlined, whether it's compensation inequities or just generally being treated unfairly from a compensation point of view, flexibility or balance, lack of opportunities or promotions, particularly during the childbearing years. Unfortunately, we can't solve that if we think we're going until we have men having children. And if that's not going to happen, then we need to solve it in a very different way. And then another item that came up several times, both in the book and just generally speaking in my professional network, is that feeling of being excluded, whether it's at events or during critical decision making. I'd like to offer this interesting example that I came across a few months ago. There's a Fortune 500 company that a year ago surveyed all of its employees on a number of different issues and metrics. And one of the things that came back that surprised them was that they had this very strong feeling from their female employees that they didn't feel included. And so in order to address that, the Fortune 500 company this year has announced, now granted we're still in the middle of a pandemic, but that will, that will, that will, we will emerge from that. But they have announced a new corporate policy that says that for any sanctioned corporate event that includes three people, there must be women. And so they didn't also offer all other lenses on dimension and diversity, uh, but I expect that that is uh, you know, a continuation of that. And I thought that was really quite an interesting way for them to just nail that on the head and say, you know, we're going to have to address that. Um, Holly also made a good point earlier about women who self-select, particularly when there are compensation inequities and they go off and start their own businesses. So it's great news in Canada that 40% of our self-employed individuals are women. But the sad part is that within corporate Canada, academia and the government, we don't have enough female role models in the, in the executive ranks. Holly? Okay, uh, Dawn, based on sorry. your- so, Sorry, Paul, I was just struggling with the mute button there for a yeah. second. There you go. Uh, my there. apologies. Sharon, thank you so much for sharing your insights and there's so much there. And uh, I'm going to touch on some of the points that you've made in subsequent questions. So again, my apologies. Uh, Don, I'd like to turn it over to you. And based on your personal experiences and expertise, 
why is gender equity so important at the end of the day? From my perspective, I, I think it is important uh, because at the end of the day, it leads to better business results. The book has mentioned without gender equity, we are losing the power and uh, productivity from half of our population. Uh, so that's a very big missed opportunity for our business and for our society in general. I've been working in investment industry, uh, idea generation and complete perspective of uh, uh, risk return profile of investment uh, is very important. That's where you can see how diverse perspectives from diverse uh, people, diverse group of people can really add value to uh, investment uh, result. Uh, for the board and investment committee I, I'm sitting in, uh, time and time again, I've observed the situation where you know, the traditional veteran investors um, represented by uh, white male uh, long-term uh, executives would, uh, you know, state certain, uh, certain makes certain statement as matter of fact, whereas um, you see uh, uh, women uh, leaders can chime in, ask wise questions, and just lead uh, the discussion into a different level of, of uh, depth. For example, you know, a very recent vivid discussion we had in for one of the uh, charity organization was, oh, why, why does our portfolio have an allocation on Canadian equity? And um, you have a traditional voice of, hmm, we are a Canadian, uh, Canadian charity, of course, we should have Canadian equity. Whereas it's being, you know, once the statement is made and then another uh, female uh, leader chime in is saying, oh, let's think about it. Canadian GDP is three to five percent of uh, of global GDP, and why do we need twenty percent? Why do we allocate twenty percent? Why do we make the decision to overweight so much on Canadian uh, equities? Are we looking for uh, passive return, meaning that we expect Canadian GDP is going to outgrow uh, all the other part of the world, or are we looking for active return? which means that our Canadian managers can do much better than other region, uh, region, regional managers. So those questions make the group pause and then you know, really analyze the issue in a very systematic uh, way. So in the investment world, before you make the investment, if you can see a more complete picture of risk return, um, the profile of, of those investment decisions, it will lead to uh, a better investment result. So uh, in, in just firsthand, uh, lively every day, I'm seeing these happening. So I think that um, you know, when we get gender equity, when uh, both gender and to that matter, you know, all uh, diverse um, uh, people sit on the same same table looking at um, our uh, business together, that, that's when we can achieve much better uh, business results. That's excellent, thank you. One of the interesting perspectives we saw in the book is that contrary to widespread belief, female board members tend to be less risk averse than their male counterparts, largely as a function of super competence and a perception that women tend to make informed risks or take informed risks that can enhance performance across the board. So uh, that seems to be exactly what you're talking about, Don. Thank you so much. Mary, let's turn to the CAPS leadership framework. In the book, you stress the importance of adaptability and this need for ambitious women to sort of overcome socialized tendencies to keep their heads down, work hard, and to assert themselves more forcefully, at least on a situational basis. So given the biases and barriers they face in the workplace, how important is it for aspiring female leaders to raise their hands, mm. take some risks that we just mentioned and exercise their voices? 
Well, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this panel. And I'm here today in a personal capacity and very proud to be one of the 50 leaders in the book. And I just wanted to start off by noting the invisible rules and CAPS model are amazing. And without any doubt in my mind, it will change people's lives for the better. To your question, adaptability, it's essential. As the story goes, men get hired and promoted based on potential and self-promotion. Women get promoted on the basis of proven performance over an extended period. This is the prove it again bias that Holly mentioned earlier. Rightly or wrongly, women have been socialized to keep their heads down, do great work, and hope that they'll get noticed. Unfortunately, in most situations, it just doesn't work that way. I, like virtually every other senior leader interviewed for this book, have been there. During the first part of my career, I watched as male peers and at times more junior colleagues climbed the ladder more rapidly than the women. In many cases, this involved a lot of astute politics and self-promotion rather than exceptional merit. It was incredibly frustrating and demoralizing. There's a wonderful story in the book from one of my former colleagues who announced a restructuring in the division she led that would produce two senior positions. Within a matter of minutes, three men were at her office door to announce their interest in their new roles. The equally qualified female candidates, on the other hand, sent emails requesting a formal meeting time and a better understanding of the job requirements. Well, the men just assumed that they could handle the job, regardless of the formal requirements. The women wanted to make sure that they ticked all of the boxes, and then some, before applying. I'm guessing this sounds pretty familiar. From a career advancement perspective, this assertive behavior places men at a distinct advantage over women, and less assertive men, for that matter. So we need to learn to assert ourselves a little more aggressively and to take more personal and professional risks. It's a lesson that most of the women interviewed for the book, myself included, learned the hard way. That doesn't mean that we should be inauthentic or become overly political. It's about talking to organizational leaders, sharing our ambitions, and asking for opportunities, ideally even before they arise. So we need to embrace opportunities and challenges that are offered, no matter how scary they might be. And of course, we always need to continue to work hard and contribute to positive business outcomes. Taking these risks help us gain essential experience, add to our credentials, build profile inside and outside of organizations, and contributes to building successful careers. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, th and thank you for sharing that story because I'm sure that it resonates with so many of us who are online today and uh, many of us can relate to that personally or we have colleagues or friends who have also experienced that, uh, that same phenomenon. I'm gonna turn my next question over to Sharon. And Sharon, our leaders tell us that most ambitious women have had an overwhelming tendency to want to do it all, especially early in their careers. And it can be exhausting and even debilitating over time. Sharon, building on the CAPS leadership framework, you state in the book, and I will read the quote, every woman needs support. That's our reality. Every ambitious woman needs support, whether it's childcare, elder care, managing the household, managing the imbalance is critical. And I love that term, managing the imbalance. Until we have equity in the household, it's difficult to find equity at work. Would you mind taking a few minutes to expand on your thoughts? Sure, thanks. Happy to, Holly. And, um, you know, I, I really did mean managing the imbalance. I think that um, for far too long, we've said we want to achieve balance. And I think there's nothing wrong with sometimes being a little bit out of balance. Uh, but I think what I'd like to see is people thinking more about their personal lives and personal selves and focusing there a little more than on the professional side uh, at points in their life and, and throughout their lives um, in order to uh, create that sort of happy environment. Um, 
you know, there are many, many studies that indicate that women share or shoulder, I should say, the burden of uh, household chores, uh, elder care, child care, etc., disproportionately. Um, and, you know, back to my earlier comment, un until that changes, it's really quite difficult. And so, you know, you look at some of the things that all of us as leaders spoke about in the book, you know, there's sort of four areas of support, you know, the, the stuff closest to you, the family support are, uh, you know, parents, extended family, others that you can lean on as and when you need for child or elder care or anything else that might be in your personal life that needs attention um, that is distracting you from professional, your professional life. So the, having, you know, supportive people around you, whether they're your partners or spouses or just in your, your bigger, broader family, that's critical. Um, you already mentioned outsourced. Um, I used to joke when I was younger that I outsourced motherhood entirely. Um, the, you know, the expression about uh, needing a village or it takes a village to raise a child is very, very true. I think under the outsource category, and there were some examples in the book um, where you know, women chose to uh, use some of their disposable uh, resources, some of their financial resources in order to hire uh, outside help. Not everyone has that at their disposal. What, what I've seen in more recent years are very creative ways of doing this outsourcing. You know, if your best neighbor across the street is, is the greatest gardener, trade that off, right? <laughs> you garden for me and I'll do something for you. And guess what? We can get there. And then, you know, there's a really great quote or example in the book where someone says, you know, so what if I didn't get the chocolate chip cookies? Now the kids are having oatmeal raisin or whatever, it, whatever the types of cookies are. We just need to figure out where the parameters are. So outsourcing where you can, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's all uh, using financial uh, dollar resources. Um, organizational support is huge, absolutely huge. Companies with friendly policies, I think in the past we always called them family friendly and somehow that meant these were women's policies. I don't agree that that's necessarily what they are. It's just what are the lifestyle balance or imbalance friendly policies. And for any in our audience who are younger in their career, uh, my advice is that you pick your employer very carefully. So look for those employers that have those friendly policies where they have leaders who exhibit the same characteristics that you do and include um, things like flexibility uh, in your life. Um, and then the last thing is sponsorship, which you touched on a little bit earlier, having an advocate at the table. Let's face it, it's very difficult with the statistics that we outlined at the beginning of this uh, session in the movie, uh, with the statistics being so low on women re represented at those boardroom and, and corporate tables to have any kind of support when it comes to promotional opportunities or compensation. So having an advocate, someone who's already at that table, who is sponsoring you is absolutely critical. So that's what I would expand upon the four areas uh, of, of for support under the CAPS framework. Fabulous, great summary, thank you. Um, it's interesting, a number of the leaders we talked to uh, said with all seriousness that you, you need to pick your spouse as carefully as you pick your organizations too, because they can be a huge impediment to career growth. And so many of the women we talked to either had stay-at-home spouses or spouses who had equally demanding jobs, so at least understood the demands that were being placed on, on the individuals as they were seeking their, their leadership roles. Don, um, we've just talked about a, a adaptability and, and support to key platforms of the, the CAPS leadership model or framework. Um, which of the platforms resonated most with you and why? Um, I have to say it's profile um, because uh, for the other three strategies, uh, the credential, uh, adaptability and the support, I felt I was intentionally uh, leveraging them in my course of uh, seeking career uh, development. 
but uh, I wasn't consciously uh, building the, uh, the profile. Um, I think I was aware of the value of personal brand and um, built the reputation of uh, delivering good business results by working very hard and always ensure the quality of deliverables. Um, the rewards from that is uh, all my career moves were driven by uh, other people who have worked with me, uh, either approached me or provided uh, opportunities uh, to me. Um, I like how uh, the book provides uh, a framework of four levels of uh, celebrity and strategies on how to, how to build them uh, gradually. Um, especially I felt when uh, the book mentioned example of uh, uh, some uh, female executives use uh, uh, their industry celebrity, uh, something the, the relationship or credibility they built in there to bring uh, lively uh, work opportunity within the department. Um, I thought that's a, that's a good idea. I learned something uh, from that. Uh, I, I felt the same as one of the book, uh, book's quote, um, which is, uh, you know, I wish I had known about these things at the beginning of my career, uh, which might have uh, uh, make my uh, journey, uh, you know, uh, maybe a bit easier or faster. Thank you so much, Don. And it's, it's something that you said really resonates with me is that you, you, you worked hard and you did really good quality work. And that was one of the ways that you were recognized in terms of individuals who were supporting your career journey. And that's exactly what we're talking about with, when we talk about sponsorship is that people who see those qualities that you have and are willing to showcase you knowing the incredible contribution that you're going to make to an organization and that that whole notion of sponsorship is something that I would really challenge organizations to think hard about in terms of how they can be more intentional about sponsorship, uh, particularly with women and intersectional um, employees. Now, I'd like to turn over my next question is to Mary. So, Mary, one of the key learnings coming out of the COVID crisis is that employees and female employees in particular want and need greater workplace flexibility. How can organizations provide flexibility without guilt as a reality? <laughs> Thank you for that question, Holly. Um, as devastating as COVID has been, it's confirmed something that most women have understood for a very long time. There's a huge difference between face time and productive time. So we've shown we have the technology to permit people to work remotely and have for some time now. We're all just finally making fuller and more successful use of it. Just because you need to take some time away from the office to deal with a sick child or attend a special event, it doesn't mean that you're not committed to your career and contributing to your organization. As long as you're delivering the same results that you would at the office, why should it really matter? And that goes for men as much as it does for women. Most men I know want flexibility as much as their female colleagues do. Many men would love to be more active fathers and partners, but in a traditional workplace, they can be reluctant to make full use of the flexible working arrangements that are available to them. They can be concerned that they'll be judged harshly by their bosses, and for good reason. Historically, this has been a career limiting move. The problem is that until now, most flexible work arrangements have been viewed as accommodations or concessions for female employees, a reminder that women somehow need help to balance their responsibilities. By taking advantage of these female programs in some organizations, they could be perceived as being less committed to their careers than their male counterparts. To create flexibility without guilt, Organizations need to promote flexible work arrangements as employee programs rather than female programs. At the very least, men should be encouraged to make fuller use of the work-life balance opportunities provided by their employers. 
Of course, it helps when key leaders set the example. A few of the leaders in the book propose that men should actually be mandated as a matter of policy to take some form of paternity leave following the birth of their child. This imposed leave would help to destigmatize things and reposition parenting as a shared responsibility. The mandated leave would also give affected men a more intimate perspective on the demands of balancing work and family commitments, as well as the difficulties and pressures associated with returning to workplace after a child related leave. The result is flexibility without grief or guilt and a huge step toward gender equity in the workplace. Thank you, Mary. Um, full disclosure, uh, 27 years ago, I quit my job to stay home to be a full-time dad so that my wife could continue her pursuits and her career. Now, something changed in the mix uh, along the way, and that was fine too, but it was a uh, family decision based on a, rather than a personal decision at the time. So I agree with you, Mary, that there are so many men that I talk to that really do regret that they weren't more active fathers and spouses and, uh, and can't get that time back. But uh, uh, I think as we move forward, we're starting to see some momentum around men taking more time and, and accepting the opportunities that organizations are presenting. And I think it's a wonderful thing. So We'll continue. So despite some of the positive steps that appear to be growing momentum uh, um, on the gender equity front, the leaders voiced throughout the book their disappointment at the rate of change. Now, Don, you actually stated in the book, and this is the quote, we've come a long way, but we still have a bit of a canyon to cross. Women have done a lot over the past 20 years to highlight the issue of gender equity but many men still need to change their attitudes and behaviors. Maybe it's just a matter of creating awareness and overcoming what are largely unconscious biases, but we need to build the bridge from both sides and to meet somewhere in the middle if we're going to see real change. That's a great, uh, great line, by the way. So how do we collectively inspire leaders and white male leaders in particular to make gender equity a strategic imperative? Yeah, I, I feel that, uh, you know, as I mentioned, I mean, first and foremost, we need to increase awareness. I felt that uh, on women's side, we, we feel that uh, the playing field is not level, but normally for people who, who are on the other side uh, doesn't feel the same way. So we need to make sure that they actually are aware of the situation so that you know, we can make conscious decision uh, on policies and processes in recruiting, developing, retaining, and promoting people uh, so that both genders have uh, a level playing field. Um, secondly, I, I, I think we can share with a broader group of leaders, share research papers on the better business results achieved by companies with more uh, gender equity, share personal experience on both negative and positive situations, uh, share frameworks and processes that can make things right, uh, share what works and what doesn't work uh, in the pursuit of uh, uh, gender equity. I think that's what Juan and Molly are trying uh, to do through the book and, uh, and this uh, event. Um, and lastly, but not, uh, not least, I think we need to build uh, allies. Um, I, you know, Molly pointed out at the beginning of, uh, of our conversation, uh, you know, we can only get there with the whole population. Only half population wanted it doesn't, uh, would not work. Uh, we need to build uh, allies like Paul um, so that uh, we motivate the whole population to uh, resolve the the issue uh, together, build the bridge. Thank you. Sharon, do you have thoughts around that? Yeah, the way I think about allyship is a collection of verbs. So advocate, uh, you know, advocate for someone, share, share any growth opportunities that you may have, but may not be available or obvious to someone in an underrepresented population recognize systemic 
inequality, recognize the impact of microaggressions, those offhand comments that happen that people tend to just let go by. Listen really carefully to what someone is telling you. And then lastly, believe their stories. If it's a, a gender equity issue, you should listen to the gender. If it's another underrepresented member of of uh, diverse, another different diverse population, you must listen and believe those experiences because you cannot assume that you know or understand someone else's experience or point of view if you haven't walked in his or her shoes. Excellent. Thank you. Mary. Excellent comments, Don and Sharon. Um, there, there's a wonderful line in the book that says, when it comes to gender equity, women need coaching, men need education. I'm pretty confident that there is no overriding male conspiracy to sustain the existing power structure and to deny women leadership roles. I mean, from firsthand experience, most male executives seem to genuinely embrace gender equity. The difficulty is most leaders and male leaders in particular uh, simply don't understand their existing biases. The overwhelming tendency for like to hire like and the significant barriers that so many women face in the workforce. And this is what needs to change. Um, as Holly mentioned earlier in the session, gender equity is not strictly a female or a social justice issue. It's a strategic business issue that will ultimately impact business results in a positive manner. So it is going to become even more difficult for organizations to compete in an increasingly competitive and global business environment, particularly true for organizations that continue to limit their ta talent pools. Thank you, Mary. Um, thank you, Dawn. And thank you, Sharon. And I am mindful of the time. And I knew, know we do have some questions that are in the chat. We've got a really great question. Um, that I'd like to I'd like to turn over to our panelists, and uh, so let me uh, share it with everybody. And the question is that women often feel conflicted about their own success, guilty of what they didn't do, or how they might be perceived. So self-serving. Uh, would you like to speak to your own experiences or observations on women and guilt? And what advice, this is a great question, and what advice would you give to other women? Thank you for uh, asking that question. I'm, I'm happy to offer an example. Um, for years and years, I stressed over missing a school event of my son's when he was in about seventh grade. Um, and it was important to him. It was the sort of annual science fair uh, project and the science fair itself where the kids would demonstrate this, you know, wonder, wonderful engineering feat that they had um, designed, et cetera. And I simply couldn't be there. And I stressed about that for years. And not that long ago, we came across something, he and I were together and we came across something in an article and it referred to this contraption and I said, oh, that was, that's very similar to your grade seven science experiment. And he just was completely <laughs> void of anything. I said, what, what do you mean? What did I make? I don't remember anything about it. But I had stressed for years over missing that. Um, and so I think my advice to myself was get over it, honestly, and saying it as politely as I can to myself. Um, kids will be resilient, they will learn, they will move on, uh, and they may not even remember some of these things that we tie ourselves up in so many knots over. Thanks so much, Sharon, and it's, I can certainly relate to your, your experience. Uh, one, of the, one of the leaders in the book talked about, and I thought, it, again, it was, a, it was a great story, where she said, for years, I have no idea what my husband and the children ate while I was away, whether it was chicken fingers or french fries. I don't care and I don't want to know. I learned that I had to let it go a long time ago, that I certainly couldn't control it. And they all seem healthy and well-functioning members of society. So um, I, I am sure that that leader uh, sh shared a similar uh, challenge that that you uh, experience and expressed. I'm looking here to see whether or not we have any other questions in the chat. 
Um, but mm -hmm. well, I think in terms of time, we might be over to our last uh, questions. Um, I, unless uh, Mary or Don, did you want to pick up on that or we're okay just to come to the closing question now? I'll so just chime in for, uh, for a point related to that uh, uh, question. Um, I was faced with a situation where I needed to, to make a, a career uh, decision on taking on the job that's more demanding, uh, require me to travel more and we need to move locations, etc. So I was very conflicted because my daughter was very, very young. I felt, oh, if I need to travel, I couldn't be home with her. And should I take it? Should I not take it? I, I was fe feeling very guilty if I I seek for my uh, career development. So I went to this mentor of mine. Um, he was my first boss and I kept in touch with, with him for 20 years. And what he told me when I consulted his advice, he was saying that, uh, uh, Don, you should seek what you, uh, you want because uh, don't underestimate, you are a role model for your mm. daughter. Um, if you do well in your career, even if you spend less time with her, the impact on her is actually outweigh uh, the, the, you know, the less time you spend with her. And uh, I felt really uh, encouraged by what he told me. And, but I didn't see you know, what's the impact on my daughter until when she was grade five. One day she came to me and asked, uh, Mama, what, what is a stock? What is investment? I was surprised by the question. And then she just said that, you know what? I, I want to do what you do when I grow up. So at that time, I realized that you know, a lot of the times that we felt it could be negative for the children, it actually uh, is positive impact on them and longer term uh, impact. So um, I, I would echo Sharon's uh, message, focus on the positive and uh, you, know, you will have uh, uh, unintended, unintended positive surprise uh, from, uh, from what we do. That's great. So we're just about out of time, but I would like to do, if we could, by way of quick wrap up is to toss one more question out to you and uh, within a minute or so each is um, let us know that, um, just to ask you, what is the best piece of advice that you as a senior leader can offer to women looking for the big job and to the extent possible organizations looking to balance that C-suite? Uh, Mary, we'll start with you. Great, thank you. Um, my advice, find a sponsor. It's so important to have someone who believes in you and can see the potential in you, even if you don't. Uh, once, uh, oftentimes we're judged by what we've done today versus what we're capable of. So find someone who sees the potential in you and reach out to them. Um, there's a saying in business that prospective leaders don't actually climb the corporate ladder. They're dragged up the ladder by the scruffs of their necks. Uh, and they are dragged up by people in positions of power who see their potential and want them to succeed. And they help to ensure that they do. So that would be my, uh, my quick one minute advice with our limited time. Great. Don? So uh, to women looking for the big job, I would just share uh, a motto. Uh, it always seems impossible until it's done. You can do it. Uh, for organizations looking for balance the C-suite, uh, I would say there are equal numbers of great women and great men. Uh, please look harder and get out of your comfort zone in recruiting. You will enjoy the added perspectives better solutions and improved business results. Excellent. And final word to Sharon. Sure, for women, don't be shy, put up your hand, be visible and take a risk. Get outside your typical zone and move on to other roles. Because if you don't do it, no one else will do it for you. So put up your hand, don't be shy, 
take a risk, get outside of your comfort zone, and for organizations, also take that risk and look for people who may be non-traditional for that next promotion. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Uh, regrettably, that brings us to the close of today's session, and I hope that you found it as instructive as we did. We'd like to thank our remarkable panelists for the sharing their candid insights and personal experiences. And again, to uh, use Don's phrase, to serve as wonderful role models for next generation leaders. We'd also like to thank uh, Green Shield Canada for their continued support and vocal advocacy for gender equity. And a quick special shout out to Sarah Murphy and Monique Diolt for their help arranging the meeting. Thank you so much. So, this is very much a passion project for Holly and me, and we invite you to contact us at any point to continue the conversation through any medium. And of course, we encourage you to read the book. Uh, with input from 50 senior female executives, it provides, we think, a, a nice blueprint for aspiring leaders looking to advance their careers and for organizations committed ultimately to gender equity. So thank you all for joining us. We hope you have an excellent day. Thank you, everybody.